Let's uh, go out on video chat this morning and visit with our good friend, Paul LaPolice. I think we are all still getting used to him being the head coach of the Ottawa Red Blacks. We still associate him with the Blue Bombers. Uh, and I, I, that's my question. Where are you today, Lapo? Have you moved to the nation's capital yet, or are you still in the Manitoba capital? No. <laughs> yeah, we've been here since May. So we moved in, uh, We moved during a pandemic and spent uh, all summer here. So it's, it's actually been really good. All right. Well, how is how's the holiday been for your large and growing family, the Lapalises? Yeah, you know, it's been weird because, uh, you know, certainly you don't we haven't seen anybody since we've moved, which is very different for us. If you think about it, we've had multiple you know, moves in our life and uh, certainly people come out for games, come over to see you. But just certainly the last couple of, the last couple of months, nobody's come to see us because of uh, the pandemic. So it's been very strange. And certainly meeting neighbors and stuff's a little different. Uh, but we actually got a good crew of people that we kind of close by that are hopefully within our circle of 10 that we spend time with. So it's really nice. Well, I'll tell you what. One thing about football people, I think they've been able to handle the pandemic the best because of the life. You get it. One play at a time. The mental toughness. Always look it over your shoulder, right? You, you guys, players and coaches, kind of prepared for this through the way your life has uh, been. Yeah, you know, like I, 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 I think the hard part is always uh, people understanding con- control what you can control is a big thing we always talk about, and you know, so there's still plenty of work to be done. Um, I know we have as a coaching staff and working uh, and making sure we're doing stuff each week and. Uh, making sure we just get together because I have a new staff, right? And I believe truly like there's nine teams in the league and there's nine people that had to survive this, uh, this breakage of the play. Well, who does it the best? Which coaching staff gets the closest? Which coaching staff learns everything that they need to do to uh, execute game day situations, Rod? Like who is preparing? And, and especially us with a new staff, we're behind the eight ball because we weren't together as much as, you know, Calgary or some teams like Winnipeg or something like that. So we've really done our best to try to spend time together going over things. And certainly scripting training camp has already been done for next year. We're redoing our playbook and all different things where you have time uh, and, and you try to it, you don't want to create busy work, but you also want to get better. I'm, I'm making notes as we go here because we had Mitch Love on from Hockey Canada, and they've enlisted the mental coach that for the World Juniors in the bubble, the same one that the Tampa Bay Lightning had, Lapo, who incidentally went on to win the Stanley Cup, and you and I have talked about the importance of this uh, at length. Um, but I mentioned I wanted to bring you on to talk about Chris Strebler. Obviously, you have an outpouring of affection for this guy. Won a great cup together. Um, how closely are, you, closely are you watching this Arizona situation? You, I'm sure you know he hasn't officially been named a starter yet. They're keeping it quiet with Connor Murray. But if he does start, what do you expect? Yeah, you know, I, I, the first thing I would say with Chris is uh, I would expect a very prepared football player, right? Um, when he started for us as a true rookie, um, the first in 25 years in the Canadian Football League, what was interesting of him is he played three games and then Matt Nichols came back. And But you, you still saw Chris Strebler in the building the same amount as he was a rookie starter. Um, and that's a testament to about his character. So he still worked hard every day. He's still prepared. So I think he's going to be prepared for whatever they've built in the game plan for him. He's not somebody who has not been able to absorb the information on a week-to-week basis. Now, he has no reps. He hasn't seen the true speed of NFL football players and all those things. Uh, but he's explosive and dynamic himself. Um, so I think he'll uh, they'll, if they build him in the right package, I'm sure he can be effective in ways. Well, what would you do? If I may ask you that as a veteran offensive coordinator and you've coached so many quarterbacks. Yeah. And I'll, I'll start with this with Chris. Like I, I do think he gets somewhat a bad rap of like this, is a guy who hasn't played a lot of football. Right. Um, and was very productive for us. I mean, th- he had 21 touchdowns his first season. Uh, he had 10 throwing touchdowns his first season. So, like, I, I think people just say, put him in a box and say he's just a runner and doesn't throw. Well, in college, he uh, like, w- we wouldn't assign him if he didn't have good completion percentage in college. And, you know, certainly, if like, his he was so good at running the football and we were so good as a team at running the football, his, his passing numbers dropped because we were effective at running it. We keep running it. Um, so I, I think if he might have been in another system and was forced to play, his 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 passing numbers are going to increase. So 
I do think he's got the ability to throw the football. It's just in the NFL, man, it's the windows are smaller, the field's smaller, and they're just so much faster. So the windows open and close smaller. But I, I think he can, you know, they also would not make him the number two if they didn't feel he threw the ball well enough to, to win games also. Well, obviously, you've been following it incredibly closer. And what do we think about as a NFL quarterback? 6'3", 6'4", I do anyways, stand in the pocket, rocket arm, and he's not that. He's a tank. So, like you say, K- Kingsbury obviously sees something in him that you guys saw in him. But how satisfying was it when he started that banjo bowl? And he did throw for significant yards and won the game for the Blue Bombers against the Rough Riders in 2019. Yeah, you know, uh, he, I think he's got a rookie record of in his first three starts as a true rookie, he threw nine touchdowns. He had three touchdowns in three straight games. So he's got the ability to do that. Um, I think he gets, he, like I said before, like he runs so well, people just say oh, he's a runner. He's a taste in hell. But the game has certainly changed in the NFL. You watch <laughs> the guys down there uh, in the NFL aren't the statues anymore, and that's not what's getting drafted. They want guys who can create with their legs. Uh, you know, Mahomes – Anytime you see he's in a struggle of a game, uh, there was a game early in the year I was watching, and it was a drive to win at the end of the game. And there's three crucial first downs, and he gets them all with his legs. Um, so, like, that, that's what's a nightmare for a defense. So I think more teams are trying to build that, trying to find people to develop those type of guys and put those guys in their organizations. Um, how I'd use Chris, you know, to go back to that question is, you know, i just make sure, you know, that he's put in a position to get the ball to the playmakers. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be downfield throws. It could be screens. It could be other things. I'd get him involved in the run game. Um, and I'd make sure we have a decent play action game to get behind him. Because I think people are going to, if he is playing, they're going to say, stop the run. So you got to give him opportunities to push the ball downfield. You know, it's interesting you say that, by the way, the switch, the trendy thing of the NFL, because it was that big six foot four pocket passer. And it's still Aaron Rodgers, might be MVP, but Mahomes, Russell Wilson, those kind of guys. And I'm wondering if it's changed in the CFL, because Zach Caleros is a guy that can get it done with his legs if he has to, right? You guys won a great cup with him. So how about Nick Arbuckle? Where does he fit in in starters in the Canadian Football League in terms of his abilities? Obviously, you thought a lot of them to get him. Yeah, you know, uh, the the impressive thing about Nick through the process, um, I watched every throw he made the previous two seasons. And the thing he did is he kept he stayed on the field. So if somebody blitzed him, he saw the hot throw and he threw the hot throw for a first down. Uh, somebody played zone, he, he, he hit the zone, uh, the weakness of the zone and threw a completion. Scramble, he scrambled. He's not as much a scramble like a straveler. He's, gonna, he's more like Bo Levi. He's going to stay in the pocket and find the downfield throws. Um, so he was impressive that he kept his team on the field. And eventually those first downs led to touchdowns. And uh I think he's, uh, you know, that's the, his, his key was he made great decisions with the football. He's very accurate and didn't throw a lot of interceptions. So you can win a lot of football games when that happens. Jeff in Winnipeg's watching. He says, wow, I totally forgot about Arbuckle going to Ottawa. Well, that's why we need to do these shows and talk CFL to keep people up to speed. Colin in Ottawa is watching, and he says, Paul, you had the best O-line in the league in Winnipeg in 2019, where Ottawa had one of the worst O-lines that season. What do you plan to do to address the blocking up front situation? Yeah, I'm not sure if I, you know, most people would uh, rank the Ottawa Red Blacks, you know, in 2019 would say one of the strengths was their offensive line. I think when you have young quarterbacks or quarterbacks haven't played a lot, that can really make it look bad on the line. I I, I was pleased with the talented offensive line when we took the job um, with Mateus, McMillan, Johnson, um, and uh, certainly some guys we think uh, that we've got in the pipes to build on. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's you, you certainly need to be able to run the football, but I don't know if we're going to look like what we look like in Winnipeg. Uh, it's certainly uh, our team will dictate what we do. I do believe in running the football because, again, you don't want to put it on a quarterback to throw it 60 times a game. I just don't think, uh, you know, uh, unless the week dictates that. Like, I don't know if that's a recipe for success for 18 weeks. Um but we will try to see what our guys can do best and then try to figure out, you know, we'll certainly run the football will be part of what our process is. Uh, I, you know, we were pretty outstanding in Winnipeg. I don't know if, if it shows up that way, but it doesn't matter. We'll show up and try to find a way to get our two points each week. So you are one of those 
coach what you have, guys. Not trying to fit fine players for your system kind of guys. Well, yeah, I, I think your system, an interesting thing, people always talk about, if you go back to Strebler, it's like when Strebler made, we made the transition to Strebler, that it was, wow, they could just, they could jump in from system to system and it was seamless. Um, that was by design, right? That was a process we had started after our, you know, going into the 2019 season, you know, when he had reps in training camp, he certainly had reps to improve as a passer and do what we needed him to grow with his second year. But also there was a package for the quarterback each week. And not that we did things that were too different than uh, what our offensive line had to do. It looked similar. It was just the quarterback was the ball carrier. Um, so I, I think the beauty is your system's got to be big enough and you have to have foresight enough to go, all right, let's make sure if this happens, we can go to this package quickly. And I think that's why we had some success. Our coaching staff um, did a really good job of going, all right, this is Stradley's strengths. Let's practice this leading into training camp. And that's going to give us this big package. And, and certainly getting him in the games, uh, we always enjoyed putting him in the game in short yardage and keeping him in. Um, and we wouldn't do that if he wasn't a good player. Um, so, yeah, I, I always think it's best to dictate your system's going to be big enough to incorporate what your players do, and then you figure out, you know, how to implement what your players do best. Lapo, there's a flood of uh, questions coming in. I'll, I'll limit it to two more. Nice. Uh, yeah, for sure. Frankie Benvenuti. Yeah, let's go. Nobody okay, you got him. Let's go. Okay, good. Then you're good for all of them. I'm good. Uh, Frankie <laughs> in Ottawa. He hosts a podcast out there. Super dude. He says, "What's the plan for Dominic Davis?" And the question just slipped off the screen. I didn't catch. The, oh, there it is. Is that a player you are interested in having back in any role? Dom Davis won some games for Ottawa quarterback, right? Yeah, you know, uh, certainly. Uh, you know, we were. He'll go to training camp and compete with the guys. Um, we, we certainly, um, you know, like his experience. I had, he's certainly been in our system before. So he's somebody we uh, certainly want to come in to compete for that second string job with some other guys. Um, it's very interesting with the, uh, the salary cap management system. Is it, it, What's interesting is years ago there used to be, let's say, 2012 to 16, there might be, you have your quarterback, number one, who's your starter. Then your number two guy is at a money range that is dramatically higher than your number three guy. Let's put it that way. You might go get Kevin Glenn to be your backup, or you may get years ago a Michael Bishop, and then you had a real young guy. Well, with the, you know, just with the cap, you know, what's happening is that number is coming closer. So the two is really not that far away from the three number. And that's been, uh, so that's how it's, you know, the competition has gotten harder for those two spots. It's really not an assigned two anymore. Um, it, it's gotten harder to have that number two because the, the money has dropped. So, uh, but we certainly like Dom and, and the things he's done. We'll give him that opportunity to compete to be the number two. I know all those comments coming in can be a little distracting. At least they are for me. Arlen Bruce, the third Spider-Man is watching. He says reps and touches. Is that a Winnipeg thing you guys had? Is that? Oh, my God. Our, a good man. I enjoyed coaching that guy. He was a lot of fun. Our time in Winnipeg and then uh, uh, our time in Winnipeg and then we had a little bit of time with the Argos. No, that guy was a player now. Like, here's a quick story about him. He was playing field number one when I get to Winnipeg. It's my first time as a coordinator in uh, 02. And I move him from Z, field on the ball receiver, to field slot. And he's like, oh. And it like three weeks, it like two weeks into training camp, I hate this. I hate this waggle. I just want to go out there and just throw me up the ball. I'm like, trust me, trust me, just stay here. And then like six weeks in the season, he's like leading the CFL and him and Milt are leading the CFL in touchdowns because we got him up one sideline and we got Milt on the other. But uh, yeah, he was awesome, man. What's up, Arlen? Happy holidays, buddy. Are you are you old enough, Darren, to remember the game? And maybe I think he was playing for the Tie Cats. Lapo, I don't think you were. With Arlen, but remember he scored a touchdown and he pulled the Spider-Man mask out of his pants, put it on, yeah. and he got fined. What's wrong with the CFL? That's creative stuff. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> that I mean, is so crazy. Uh, so the guy, Lauren in Pittsburgh, is not letting it go. The strength coach, if you were watching earlier, he wants to know who would win, the Calgary Stampeders or the Jacksonville Jaguars CFL rules. How do you answer that? CFL rules? Yeah. Uh, the, uh, I, I think the CFL team would win, right? Like, I don't know if there is an easy way to say, 
you know, again, how long do they have to prepare to understand motion and those things? Like, it's just a different league now. Like, you know, I, I came to the call late. So if you just said they were playing and you tried to sort out how the rules are similar, I, I don't know. Like, you, you know, if you have a really good football team, right. And you're not turning the ball over, you got a chance to win any game. Um, I, I used to hear this often. People would say the Miamis, of the, you know, you, when I first came up into the league, and I really didn't have a good understanding how good the talent is in the league. That when somebody would say, "Oh, uh, University of Miami could beat the Argos or whatever, or something like that," and these are grown men playing. It's not young college kids, which the colleges are have different ranges of guys, and there's a lot of guys who come up to this level and can't play. So. Uh, the talent is very underrated. Whether they're going to beat the Jaguars, I don't know. You know, hey, if the Jaguars are minus three in turnover margin, they're probably going to lose to if uh, a CFL team with a good quarterback. So, um, you know, but the talent is very good in the CFL. The, the weird thing about the Canadian Football League, I think if you look at like somebody like Bo Levi, Mike Riley, uh, Matt Nichols, uh, Zach Kolaris, what, what, any of those guys, if those guys had an opportunity, Ricky Ray, if they had an opportunity to be a number two with a team that had a maybe a quarterback coach who was on their side or there was a couple of injuries, then they may stay in that league for 10 years, right? It's all getting your opportunity and getting your opportunity to play. That's no different for Doug Flutie, Jeff Garcia, uh, or Chris Streveler, right? So Chris Streveler, you know, he goes into the league now, all of a sudden he's a number two uh, coach in the league. He's a quarterback in the league. So the talent is, uh, is, is, is a lot better than people give it credit. Uh, Lauren says, bingo. I just think it would take 60 minutes for the Jaguars to figure out the rules. I mean, the first punt situation, the returner's going like this, bang. He's like, what happened? <laughs> yeah. I think the hardest, you know, like what would blow a team's mind come most people, a, a good friend of mine's the offense coordinator at Penn state, Kurt Chiraka. And uh, it, he's been in Division One the last couple of years as a highly sought after coach. And years ago, we had an opportunity uh, to bring him on as a coach on the staff. He was out of work, and and I was going to bring him on in Winnipeg. And we were and we were talking through some things. I'm showing him film, and he's just like, "Man, it's like I'm reading in a car. I get a headache like watching your <laughs> motion." And uh, you know, that's what kind of blows people's mind a little bit. That would be the hardest part. All the coaches that come up and just say, how do you handle, you know, when you go to a moving bunch, when you go, when the guy comes out of the backfield and joins a bunch, all that stuff is very difficult compared to the more static uh, U.S. game. So that's the big adjustment that is harder for uh, you have to do a little bit more man coverage. You, you, you have to pass things off instead of locking things down as much. That's where the CFL has probably a little bit more knowledge of the picks and the crossing routes and different route combinations for that stuff. A uh, footnote on the Arlen Bruce thing. He says, I love you, Coach Lapolis. So there you go. That's always nice to hear. We're mounting a Arlen Bruce for the Hall of Fame campaign, by the way, in 2021. So you'll be hearing about that, Lapo. And we do have to run. I want to say congratulations on being the inaugural CFL Sim uh, champions, Lapo. Overcome that 0 7 start. What a story. Congratulations. And uh, yeah. let's do what it. What did we do at the end of the year, Rod? What did we do? We started out 0 7. And I remember I tweeted you. I said, I don't think so. And then, yes, you did. Uh, and then we stormed back. What did we do in the second half of the season? Tell me. Fill me in. Started making plays, my friend. That's it. You didn't give up. You kept doing what you do. You didn't get away from the game plan. You believed in yourself. Sound familiar? Nice. Nice. Good stuff. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Lapo. <laughs> Happy New Year. Okay, guys. Thank you. Yeah, the see head, ya. Take head coach of the Ottawa Red Blacks, CFL Sim 2020 champions. We'll be back with a uh, sports update. Lauren Goldenberg in Pittsburgh says, awesome interview with Lapo Rod. Outstanding. He is, wow, there's a lot of great coaches in the CFL. They're all great. But he's one of my favorites, there's no doubt. You're watching Rod Peterson On Demand. For more of the Rod Peterson Show, visit rodpeterson.com or follow Rod Peterson on social media.